you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Wow, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, thank you. Um, you're very welcome uh, here today. This is the uh, second time I've been doing this uh, teach. So anybody that was here the first time, well done for sticking out and thinking about going again. Um, but to everyone else, you're very welcome. And to those obviously listening online, um, you're also welcome too. We'll just pray and then we'll get into Ephesians 4. Great are you, God, and worthy of all our praise. Lord, I thank you that you love us. I thank you that you're here for us. I thank you that you know everything. And Father, as we listen to your word today, I just pray that you would let me speak the words you want me to speak and that we would hear the things that you want us to hear. Amen. 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 So Ephesians 4, 1 to 16 today, um, we come back to our series on um, the great letter that Paul has written to the church at Ephesus. And today is a turning point in the, in the letter. As Dougie mentioned a couple of weeks ago, um, the first half of Ephesians is about us in Christ, understanding what it means to be in Christ. And then we switch from now forward to Paul giving some practical advice on how we should apply that. And I think that the thing that strikes me is it's, it's a relatively short passage, packed full of teaching as Paul does. But Paul's in prison and Paul's had his conversion and Paul is a guy who's been around the block. He's seen both sides of what it's like to persecute Christians and he's, he's also obviously speaking loudly and proudly about who God is and what we should do. And the whole chapter is, is around unity and the maturity of, of the church and us in the church as the body. But it's interesting, isn't it, that Paul doesn't use his personal experiences as the first thing to talk about when he gives his practical application. Like he's in jail at the minute. He could be telling us what's happening out on the exercise yard as he's walking about. He could be telling us about what it was like to receive that huge conversion. He could be telling us a lot of things, but instead he decides that he's going to open the practical application with how the church should be structured and what leadership should look like in the church and how we as members of that body of Christ should behave and what we should do. And just before we get into the, the passage itself, um, I have, as you know, had little themes running through um, the talks, and today is no different. So anybody that's used to standing up and talking knows that we get set little challenges when we do that. Friends of ours, before we stand up, say to us, hey, you wouldn't just mention Canary, which was the first thing that I got asked to mention when uh, I stood up to speak for the first time. Graham, you've got to get the word Canary into the um, talk. Other times it's song lyrics. Other times it's whatever happens to be uh, amusing in the people who are not doing the speaking. And they set you these challenges. So today, uh, the four slides, if we don't count the actual and passage. The four slides today are titled The Beatles, You Too, The Christians, or you can have The Isley Brothers, but it's a church talk, so why would I not pick The Christians? Um, and Bill Withers. I have a joke about Bill Withers. It's why you don't put the duck in a microwave, because it's Bill Withers. No. Um, <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so, um, we're going to, as this is about unity and maturity, we're going to read the passage together. Um, and as we're reading it, let's think about what Paul is saying throughout it. Um, okay, let's go. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith. Can anybody figure out the U2 song at the minute? One baptism, one God, and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. 
This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. What does he ascended mean, except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, the te- to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become, in every respect, the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. As you look at the titles of the passages in the, in the Bible, it talks about unity and maturity in Christ. And it's, a, you know, it's very evident that that's what it's talking about. But if we just move to the slide entitled The Beatles, it really stopped me in my tracks, the first three verses of this chapter. In the second verse, Paul lays out the fundamental need that we all have. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Paul mentions the need for loving each other multiple times in his teaching, perhaps most famously among Corinthians 13. And I suspect if I asked those married people around the room, we'd find quite a significant number of people had 1 Corinthians 13 at their wedding or have been to a wedding where 1 Corinthians 13 was the passage that was used. It talks about what love is. And here on the table, you can see what love isn't. It's kind. It's patient. It wants good things. It isn't boastful. It isn't there to hurt people. It's not designed to manipulate people. Love isn't about point scoring or being right. It's about relationship and restoration of souls to Jesus. That's the common purpose, and that's in union with God's mission. A friend of mine in this church was going through a tough time. And I may have mentioned this before, but the one thing he said in the midst of everything that was going on, what he was told was, do you want to have a relationship or do you want to be right? Because sometimes it's not the same thing. Do you want to have a relationship or do you want to be right? Because Paul in these three verses basically takes some of the fruits of the Spirit that he lays out in Galatians and he pours them all over that church in Ephesus. What's the first fruit of the Spirit that Paul talks about in Galatians? Love. That's what he's asking us to do. Just love each other. You see, the message is that unity of purpose is important. It's key for us to move forward as disciples of Christ. But here's the kicker. And I hate to break this to some of you. We're not always going to agree. And some of us don't find that tension easy to manage. The solution is love. Or maybe we can just hear it from Jesus instead. Matthew twenty two thirty seven. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and 
love your neighbor as yourself. We need to focus on God, not our own desires or our own bias. Families are famous for it. Like, I don't know how many of you have been to weddings, family weddings, where there's a bit of drink taken or there's a grudge coming in and it just goes horribly wrong in the middle of it because nobody's thinking about what's it like to be the bride that day? What's it like in the bigger picture for all the others around us? Instead, we bring our own bias in. We bring our own hatred in. We bring our own grudges in. We don't stop to think, is this what God wants? And yes, it's difficult to disagree. But guys, come on. We disagree with people every day in work. We disagree with family every day. It doesn't stop us loving them. And if we'd start there first, instead of starting with a disagreement, we might do a bit better. Personally speaking, I, re- I remember being an elder and a director at a, at a church um, we were at before this one. And it, it went wrong between the youth pastor and the, the youth pastor and the pastor of the church. Things were said and things were, accusations were made and it involved their children and it was horrendous. And, you know, lucky me, I got asked to come in and kind of mediate and try and figure out what was going on. And to be honest, the, the, the fault, if you, if you call it that, it wasn't difficult to figure out where the blame was, who had done something wrong. And, uh, and the great news is I was able to tell them. I was able to go in there and make sure they knew the biblical principles that they'd broken and make sure that they knew the things that they'd done wrong. Um, the one slight problem was I forgot to tell them that God still loved them. I forgot to stop and say, are you okay? I forgot to stop and think, this isn't really in their character. Maybe there's something more behind it. I didn't stop to see that they were hurting. Barged on ahead and was right. But it was painful. And it's certainly a lesson given to me in the, like, in the hardest way possible. It's really difficult to continue to love people in disagreement. If we move on to the next slide, the U2 slide, I'll just read it, see if anybody can guess the song title. Make every effort to keep this unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body, one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope. You were called one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Three verses, seven mentions of the word one. I wonder what the message is. The lyrics from that song are clearly about working together in in unity. But the funny thing is that song was written in the really early 90s by you two who were in danger of splitting up because they did not agree with each other about what was going on. They didn't agree with the, the way the direction of music was going. They were in Germany. They didn't agree. It was right at the reunification of Germany. They didn't agree on political aspects of that either. But they wrote, we're one, but we are not the same. But we've got to carry each other. And then it goes on to say, love is a temple, love the higher law. You ask me to enter, but then you make me crawl. Pretty sober line, isn't it? Imagine inviting somebody into this church and then making them, making them crawl in here. Showing them no love whatsoever. And I can't be holding on to what you've got when all you've got is hurt. Yesterday here, I was making sandwiches most of the morning. Egg sandwiches, good old church sandwiches. Um, which went down a treat, didn't they, Anne? Um, but it was the steps day. It was the steps to freedom day for freedom in Christ, which is all about releasing the things that are holding you back. And you go through a series of steps to do that. But the important thing is to free yourself from what's holding you back to being one with God's purpose. And that's what we need to do because if we, the risk of sounding trite, if we don't love ourselves, 
if we don't feel that God has reached us and loved us, it's going to be very difficult to love anybody else. So the challenge is, how many times have we judged or set inflated expectations on others before we offer some kind of bond of peace? How much have you focused on yourself to get what you want rather than focusing on what God has to say and what God's will is? The Bible references unity in many places, and in each one it speaks of the diversity we encounter and indeed the diversity we need as a body to work together. Philippians 2.3 says, I urge you, my brothers and sisters, for the sake of the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to agree to live in unity with one another and put, it, put to rest any division that attempts to tear you apart. Be restored as one united body, living in perfect harmony. How many people here would denigrate the name of the Lord Jesus Christ? How many of us would actively seek to say something or be against the name of the Lord Jesus? Because that's what it says in the first line of this verse. I urge you, my brothers and sisters, for the sake of the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to agree to live in unity. Not because it's easier for you. Not because it's a nice thing to do. But for the sake of the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 12 talks, a very famous passage about arms and legs and hands and feet and everybody being part of one body. And God has placed in the church, first of all, apostles, prophets, teachers, gifts of healing, helping, miracles, tongues. Do all do miracles or all prophets or all teachers? We know that's not the case. Do all speak in tongues? No. Do all interpret? No. But eagerly desire the greater gifts. And here's how he finishes. Love is indispensable. We cannot do without it. We were recently at the Alpha Leaders Conference in London, and Tom Holland, who's a, an historian, um, I don't know what he, whether he's an atheist or agnostic. I think he describes himself as agnostic. I don't know. Anyway, he's not a Christian. But he's written this book called Dominion, and it's a massive kind of timeline of Western culture since, um, I think since the Romans. Um, and he looks at the influences of different societies, and he talks about the influence of Christianity. And he's fallen in love with Paul's writing. He calls him the most important Christian writer of all time. It's quite a claim, isn't it? The most important Christian writer of all time. And it's because it's the first set of letters and works that we have that are closest to the time of, of Jesus, right? So it's pretty raw stuff. It's, it's relevant to when Jesus was living. Why am I mentioning this? Well, Philippians, what did I read? Philippians 2, 3, 1 Corinthians 12, 1 Corinthians 13. Who wrote them all? My encouragement is have a read of Paul's letters. God eats pineapple chunks. I don't know if anybody's ever used that mnemonic for Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians. But those are his letters that he's writing, amongst others. Just got his pineapple chunks, pretty cool thing to remember. So if we move on to the functions that Paul mentions, to the Christians or the Isley brothers, if you want. It talks about the grace apportioned. It talks about the roles that we have. But guys, we have one leader in the church. And it's not any of us. Here's a hint. It is not any of us. God sets the tongue. He dishes out the gifts. He dishes out grace. He gave us the leadership roles that are needed. And Paul's talking to the Ephesians, and these are all young churches, and there's division, and there's all sorts of ideas floating around. And you know, that's the reason Paul speaks to them. He's trying to give them guidance, and it's relevant to us. The model functions on the basis that leaders with the gifting of apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, oversee ministry areas where they have a proven anointing to grow and edify the church. The major concern Paul's addressing is the kind of abuse of power and self-appointed leaders and people who are not under the authority of the Holy Spirit. 
And I know there are many versions of what these roles do. Many theories on who the top man is. Many theories about who's in charge. Because we love that, right? We love a leader. We want somebody either to look up to or we want somebody to blame. I heard the bit that resonated most there. Christ is our leader. I go back to fix your eyes on Christ, fix your eyes on God, get right there, and then move into whatever conversations or whatever leadership roles you need to do. Those functions build a team. They're equally important in their roles. They're equally gifted by the Holy Spirit. And their purpose is to fulfill maturity. It's to encourage others to serve. And honestly, if we're not doing that as leaders, we're not leaders. Here's the thing. If nobody's following you, you're not a leader. Here's my kind of view of the roles that we have. The roles specifically mentioned here, one of them takes information in. Prophets. Those who hear from God have a view on what's needed for the future. They assemble this information, they tell it, and everybody starts testing it. They're not often liked or understood or even believed. And this is an area that causes much debate. Indeed, there are many people who say, but we've got direct access to God, so why do we need them? The New Testament and John even warns about false prophets. This is my view. If they're warning us about false prophets, that kind of tends to suggest they're real ones. Otherwise, they just say, don't listen to anybody who says they're a prophet. Indeed, in the same verse, John tells us to test what is said. Pretty sensible advice. 1 Corinthians 12 that we read also intimates that prophecy still exists as a gift. So in my view then, if God has a message and he decides to send it through somebody and it's tested against scripture and it stands up to it, we've discerned it, interpreted it, and it still stands up against scripture and it still stands up against people praying into it, then I'm going to pay attention because I reckon God has got something to say. They take the news and then they send it out to other believers via apostles or apostolos, messengers with authority. Pastors and teachers, and there's debate here, right? Like, hear me right, I, I, I'm not interested in the debate. I'll leave that to biblical scholars. Both are mentioned, so I reckon both are important. Whether it's one person doing it, whether it's two people doing it, whether it's 50 people doing it, 100 people doing it, I'll let you all read it and you can make your own decision but they're both mentioned, so they're both important. Teachers and pastors. Either way, their role is to take believers under their wing, educate them, and shepherd the congregation in biblical and emotional maturity. Finally, evangelists. The guys who get to take the good news out to non-believers. The guys who get to tell anyone and everyone who wants to hear it the message of good news. The message about the death and resurrection and promises that Jesus has. Personally speaking, having been in different roles in different churches, we have two scenarios, well, we have three scenarios. One, the team works well and that's great. Two, somebody gets five roles to do and they burn out. Or three, you get an egomaniac who's in charge who wants to put their way down as the law and everybody else has to follow it and that just divides the, 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 the teams. And we can fluctuate between them all. <laughs> and it's really difficult. And it's hard for the people that are in leadership because most of the time they think they're doing the right thing. Again, my encouragement, keep going as leaders, but try and... Keep the big picture in mind. And before you start anything, think about the love that God has and think about the bigger picture. The purpose is to lead other people to service. The purpose is to build the body. 
not your own ego, to build the body. The words that stood out for me in this are, until we all reach unity in the faith, it's pretty profound for me when I read this. I kind of thought I'd be dead before I reached the full maturity and the fullness of Christ. I kind of thought I'd be in heaven before that happened. But that's not what's said here. We can get more mature until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. We can certainly get more than we have now. We go to the next slide, it's the last piece. It talks about us being children until we kind of get that maturity and, until, and how we're swayed by different arguments and we're swayed by different things that we hear and by people who want to divide us. We won't be swayed by those who argue that we have too many church denominations or beliefs, we've too many scandals, we've lost too many leaders, but instead we will be mature unswayed by the devil's schemes. The devil who comes to sow disruption and division. Right from the time of Jesus, Satan wants to sift us like wheat. But Jesus said, Peter, he wants to destroy us. Satan wants to do that all the time. His purpose is division. Our purpose is unity in Christ. I know which one I'm following. Satan wants to do it to all of us. So how do we combat it? Well, thankfully, Paul has the solution. And it's not one person. It's not a human on their own. It's a team who are deliberate about their function and role, who model love and do what their role is to the best of their ability. To the best of your ability. That is all that God is asking you to do. Yes, we'll have disputes, but real against division. Yes, we'll have disagreements, but real against division. Set aside your infant ways, and when there's only you and only your bias, set it aside and real against division. Think bigger, think unity, think love, and we'll not be too far wrong. <clears throat> Just as an aside, my encouragement is, if you're serving today, but it isn't your strength, thank you. Because that cannot be easy to do. My further encouragement is, seek out what the Lord's asking you to do. Seek your passion. Paul ends where he started. Not diving into the tasks, but reminding us of the behavior the body needs to adopt. Building itself up in love as each part does its work. It doesn't dive into the nitty gritty of the things that you need to do. Change your behavior is the first thing he's asking you to do. Not sure how you get on with the song titles. This is if anybody was able to read my mind. The Beatles is... All you need is love. You two is one. The Christians are as a harvest for the word. That's our purpose. And if you're struggling, God says, lean on me. Your team are saying, lean on me. Think unity. Think love. Amen. I'm afraid it's still me. We move on to communion. I think as we consider the love we should show one another, I'm reminded of John 15. I've loved you the way my father has loved me. Make yourselves at home in my love. If you keep my commands, you'll remain intimately at home in my love. That's what I've done. Kept my father's commands and made myself at home in his love. I've told you these things for a purpose, 
that my joy might be your joy and your joy wholly mature. This is my command. Love one another the way I have loved you. This is the very best way to love. That's magic, isn't it? This is the very best way to love. Put your life on the line for your friends. You're my friends. When you do the things I command you, I'm no longer calling you servants because servants don't understand what their master is thinking and planning. No, I've named you friends because I've let you in on everything that I've heard from the Father. You didn't choose me, remember? I chose you. And put you in the world to bear fruit, fruit that won't spoil. As fruit bearers, whether you ask, whatever you ask the Father in relation to me, he gives you. But remember the root command. Love one another.